Good morning, church, and greetings to you in Jesus' name. Another week has rolled by. Like you're aware that we as a church are meeting in person, but we are making these recordings available to those who can't attend church in person due to their special circumstances. If that's you, uh, God bless you as you listen to God's word and you keep in touch with the church uh, through uh, other uh, opportunities that are available. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we love you and adore you. We bow down before you. We declare that you are our God and we are your people. Thank you that we can come and call you as our Heavenly Father when previously we couldn't have. You made this possible by sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, you died for our sins and you were buried and on the third day you were raised up. Uh, seen by many witnesses, you instructed your disciples and then you ascended into heaven and you're interceding for us, you're preparing a place for us, you're coming back for us and to judge the world. In the meantime, you have poured out your spirit upon us and your presence today constantly reminds us that we belong to you. We have the purchased possession of God and you help us in our praying when we don't know how to pray and you also help us in our learning and you empower us in, us in our serving. So this morning we ask that you will help us, Lord, as we engage with scripture uh, to gain a deeper understanding uh, of you and to, to love you more and to serve you faithfully. We ask all this for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, today we are coming to the uh, last talk on in the series of Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 13. Uh, so that's where we are. And um, it's always good for us to remember the big picture. The big picture is God wants to have a personal relationship with a group of people uh, whom he refers to as his people. Uh, and he wants to be their God, and he wants them to be exclusively his. And he made this possible by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And uh, by responding to this message of God's good news, or God's Christ, we have repented of our sin, and we have turned towards him and received this gift of salvation. And today we continue to live and live in Christ, and we are in Christ, and uh, we have an ongoing uh, fellowship uh, with him. When we come to uh, the Jesus raised disciples, and he asked these disciples uh, to make disciples. Uh, so they went and preached Christ everywhere, and they started lots of Christ communities. And these Christ communities were made up of people who had repented uh, of their sin, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and got baptized. Uh, as a sign of work, the new work that God has begun in their lives. And um, they were not necessarily perfect. None of these groups were perfect because they all came from varied backgrounds. They had lots of baggage and sometimes old ways of doing things crept in. Sometimes uh, pressures of the world crept in. And there were a number of issues. And the apostles uh, raised up elders to instruct them. Uh, before they were elders, they had, they were when they're gone, uh, sometimes they were exposed to uh, other uh, false uh, messages and false teachers. Um, and this was the case in Corinth. When Apostle Paul was away, uh, some, there were lots of issues, right, from division to disorder to, uh, to yeah, wrong doctrine, lots of things were there. In addition to this, some false teachers had weaved their way into the Corinthian church by their style and rhetoric and uh, they tried to consolidate their position by putting Paul down as a person uh, and uh, uh, by attacking him and his ministry. Um, but the, the real danger was that we seduced these people uh, from their simplicity and their faithfulness and the love and dedication they had uh, towards serving Christ. So Paul is deeply concerned in this letter, he's defending his apostleship. Uh, we've seen in the uh, first 
uh, chunk of the chapter, I think it was chapters 1 to 7, he's defending his apostleship. And then in 8 and 9, he's talking about giving, uh, something they had agreed to give uh, to a famine relief fund in uh, Jerusalem. And it addresses that, reminding them and how to do it. Um, and then he goes on to defend his apostleship from uh, chapters 10 uh, onwards. Okay. And um, last week we looked at uh, Apostle Paul um, uh, boasting, and he said that he was he was he was boasting. He didn't like to boast, but he says he was compelled to boast, and uh, um, and then he presented his apostolic authority, and his apostolic authority said, "I uh, have got these the things that I did among you." Uh, primarily signs, wonders, and miracles, which he patiently worked among it. They are signs enough to, uh, for the proof of his apostleship. And above all, uh, there, uh, he is the one who brought the gospel to them. And you'll find that in Acts chapter 18, and uh, where he comes and brings the gospel, and spends 18 months uh, laboring amongst them and trying to raise disciples for Jesus. So they, in fact, are the proof of his apostleship. And in Corinth, uh, the false teachers or the so-called so super apostles uh, used to come with recommendation letters. And they think Paul didn't have any recommendation letter. So Paul is saying, you guys are uh, our recommendation letter. You, your changed lives is proof enough. And uh, uh, last week also he spoke about the fact that um, uh, he's afraid when he comes. He said he's coming for a third time. And uh, he says he's afraid. He's afraid he won't like what he sees when he comes and you won't like the way I behave when I come. And he's afraid that uh, some of you may not have repented of your uh, sins and you're still in your old ways. Uh, and he's afraid that um, God might humble him. So, you know, every minister loves to see fruit. And when you don't see fruit, it can be very discouraging. And Paul is saying, if there's no fruit, of all the hard work he's put in. Of course, ministry is sometimes uh, tough. There are seasons of ease and there are seasons of unease. Okay, um, so today he, we are seeing that he's going to be dealing in concluding this letter. He's going to deal with uh, one more charge and then he gives them a warning and a greeting and a blessing. Okay, he's going to do a, a defense, if you like, and then a warning uh, and a greeting uh, and a blessing. Let's look at it. So, um, the, the first of all, the charge he's trying to refute is many of people in the Corinthian church said Paul is tough in his letter, but he's weak in person when he comes. Uh, Paul refutes that and he says, when I come, uh, you're not going to see a weak person. I uh, am going to be firm and I'm going to confront uh, any who have not repented of their sin and deliberately continuing in the sin and he's going to deal with them uh, strongly uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus and he's going to do uh, church discipline. Okay, so uh, today uh, it starts off with verse uh, 1 saying, this is the third time I'm coming to you. What's the other two times? The first time was in Acts 18 when he came to start uh, the church at Corinth uh, when he spent 18 months and then latterly he made another visit, which is a brief visit, a painful visit, uh, when he had to do some correction and it left a slight aftertaste, a bad aftertaste. Uh, that was the second visit and now it's the third visit. And last time we said, he said, I'm coming, ready or not. And uh, then he quotes a scripture from the Old Testament where he says uh, that every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. In other words, um, it is you must not uh, jump to any conclusion. Uh, you must actually ascertain all your facts uh, before uh, you pass judgment. So uh, Paul's application is always do, do due diligence. Uh, if there's anything that needs to be corrected, uh, don't uh, do a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, take your time ascertain your facts, uh, and then uh, uh, with wisdom, with love, uh, start uh, trying to put things right, okay? In verse 2, it says, I want those who sinned before, and all others, I want them now while I'm absent. 
as I did when I was uh, in my second trip or my second visit. And if I come again, I will not spare them. Uh, he is giving a warning shot. He's saying, I have made a warning letter. I have come in person. Now I'm giving you one more warning in, in letter. And then be sure uh, that I will uh, confront you. Earlier we did, we did touch that and we say that some people thought that he would be weak in person. He's saying that's not the case. And um, then uh, uh, a good principle here is, um, is to give warning, uh, give them space to put things right, and don't be, uh, uh, d don't just uh, rush in. It's a good thing for people to reflect, think, give them space to act. And if they still don't, then you can go back and uh, uh, confront them uh, lovingly, of course, uh, with the idea of, which is not punitive, but uh, restorative. Okay, in verses 3 and 4, uh, since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, uh, he's saying Christ is not weak in dealing with you, but he's powerful among you. When he was crucified in weakness, but he lives in the power of God. And he's saying we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Now here uh, Paul is uh, preempting that, uh, uh, that they might challenge his firmness. And he's saying, uh, even Christ was firm with uh, uh, the Pharisees who were self-righteous, refused to uh, uh, repent of wrong uh, attitudes or wrong actions or wrong uh, position of heart. Um, they may, they always explained themselves away. And he came as a he came he came and spoke to them, and he came down on them uh, quite uh, like a ton of bricks at times. I would say, but it was, Christ was always uh, firm, Christ was always fair, and uh, he is saying that when we come, we'll be firm, we'll be fair in the way we deal with you. Okay, now we look at verses 5 and 6. He's, here he is talking about uh, examining yourself. He's saying, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. He say, prove yourself or test yourself. Don't you realize, don't you know this about yourself, that Christ is in you? What this trying to say here, Paul is trying to say is, sometimes uh, people seem to have this, uh, this forgetfulness uh, that Christ is in you. They live as though Christ is far, far away and nobody is here watching us. So we conduct ourselves in everything. If we are conscious of the presence of God, uh, that uh, affects our conduct. But when we are not conscious of the presence of God, then we try to act independently uh, because we think like he can't see. At least momentarily, we kind of think that way. Um, and uh, he goes on to say, first, before I explain that, uh, verses 5 and 6, I want you to note that he's writing to the church. He's writing to the elect in Christ. So if you belong to Christ, uh, you will bear fruit. Um, but the fruit uh, that you will bear uh, will result in changed behavior. That's how it is, because belief affects behavior or your creed affects your conduct. Um, so he's telling, examine yourself. So uh, when I'm talking about examine yourself, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, in the word disciple, right in the middle, it shares a root word for discipline. You can't be a disciple without discipline, irrespective of what uh, field it is. Uh, so, you know, when they ask, uh, you go to university, uh, what discipline are you studying? Sometimes people used to ask in my days, at least. In other words, what are you studying? What are you uh, seriously pursuing? And uh, uh, so in terms of discipline, there are three things I would like to put across. Uh, there's self-discipline, there's church discipline, and there's a divine discipline. Um, the uh, self-discipline is what he's saying here. He says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. He's saying, uh, check it out. You know, if, if uh, there is things that are not aligned, then you need to put it right. Examine yourself. It gives you an opportunity to put it right. Um, most, most people would uh, uh, know when they're doing wrong or when they are convicted they're doing wrong, they will want to put it right. Uh, if you're a child of God, that is. Then you have got the church discipline. If you continue uh, 
uh, without putting it right. And uh, you have got uh, um, a scripture from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. If someone sins against a particular brother, this is Jesus speaking. He says, uh, let that brother go and meet that person and uh, tell them of the offense. And uh, yeah, sort it out. And if uh, after having done that, there is still no change of heart, then he says, go uh, take somebody else with you uh, as a witness and uh, try and sort it out. If that doesn't work, then you go and tell the church. This is not talking about just anything that's petty. I don't like the way you are or that sort of thing. But we're talking about serious sin, uh, sinning against a brother. Okay, so that's, uh, that is the church discipline. And after they tell the church if that person does not repent or amend his ways, then Jesus says, treat them like an unbeliever. So in other words, an unbeliever does not partake at the Lord's table. So they might still attend the congregation, but they cannot attend uh, or be in a position of leadership or uh, service in that way. Because you, you, you know, when a vessel is unclean, you can't serve stuff from an unclean vessel. But it's so easy actually to get your vessel clean. You know, all you just need to do is to come to God, be open before him, express your remorse and uh, repent of your sin ask his help to uh, to overcome it and he will cleanse you and he will he's a loving heavenly father who wants his children so that is church discipline um and then you have got a divine discipline uh, in hebrews 12 6 it says the lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives so if you don't give in if you don't uh uh do self-discipline, then the church discipline, and then obviously God has got the uh, the ultimate uh, authority and the freedom to discipline His children uh, directly or through one of the uh, through through His church. And uh, remember, whenever there's discipline, the idea is not punitive, uh, but restorative, and uh, for the benefit of the church itself. Now let's go and look at verses seven to ten. Um, and then here Paul is praying. You see, uh, we, we will see Paul is praying. He is saying, we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Uh, this is the heart cry of every church leader, every church pastor, every home group leader, that we uh, live a life without doing wrong. Um, it, and we will be tested, of course, uh, that and that you may do what is right. You not only really do you may not do what is wrong, but you may do what is right. Uh, otherwise, uh, it might seem like we have failed. Uh, you know, and then verse 8, he says, we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. In other words, you can't just gather public opinion and say, yeah, yeah, this, this behavior is acceptable. No, 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 it's not that way. We can only stand and live by the truth. It is God who determines what is acceptable in his sight, not public opinion, not the culture of the day, but God and God alone. And if you say he's God, then the, the, the perfect posture is one of surrender and uh, adoration, worship and uh, submission to him. Okay, then uh, it says, we are glad when we are weak, then you are strong. Your restoration is what we are praying for. Uh, we said he's praying that you may not do wrong. He's praying that you may do what is right. And uh, uh, he's also praying that uh, you will be restored. In verse 10, he says, For this reason I write these things while I'm away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe uh, in my use of authority uh, that the Lord has given me for building and tear building up of the church and not for tearing down. He's writing again uh, these things which are quite challenging. Uh, it's not easy to correct, but uh, it has to be done. And he's writing this so that when we meet in person, uh, you might have sorted these things out uh, so he doesn't have to be tough. Uh, and it's not nice to be tough to anybody. Okay, so that's important. And again, he says his motive is to build the church up, not to uh, tear it down. Discipline. Uh, is painful but it is productive okay then we go to so uh, we see the uh, we have looked at 
his defense. We've looked at the warning. Now we're going to be looking at the greeting and the blessing, verses 11 uh, to 14. Um, he says, finally, brothers, uh, rejoice, aim for restoration. Don't wait till I come. Sort it out. Let's aim for it. Uh, strengthen one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And he says, uh, the, the God of love and, and peace be with you. He's saying, shalom. May the shalom of God, may the harmony between you and God and with each other uh, uh, be there. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on to the blessing and says, uh, uh, when things are sorted, then you can greet each other with a holy kiss. Uh, particularly in this time of uh, we've been uh, socially or physically distancing ourselves. And uh, I don't know what the culture in different parts of the world are. Uh, here, in, here in England, we uh, usually give a, a hug uh, if you know the person really well at church. Uh, or at least shake hands, and uh, that is equivalent to a Middle Eastern uh, kiss, if you like, on the uh, cheek. Uh, so uh, it has. So when things are not sorted, you can't greet somebody with a kiss. And uh, when you greet each other, it's a holy kiss because this is uh, because uh, you're in the family. You only kiss family members. You don't go in around and kiss strangers. Uh, so you, you got to keep that in mind. And so it's it's. Uh, uh, something that you can practice when issues are sorted, uh, when you're of one mind and you're living in peace. Uh, and here's the final blessing. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So in summing up, uh, uh, God loves this church. Uh, churches do have problems. God does not disown his church. God sends his, uh, his eldership, uh, apostles in this case, uh, to sort things out, sometimes by means of letter those days and visits. These days you've got resident elders who, who teach every week from the Word of God. And, the, the, and every week there's an appeal. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. So examine yourself and sort it out. If there's anything that needs to be sorted out, if there's anything that's displeasing in the eyes of God, sort it out, sort it out. And so that uh, we don't have to do the church discipline uh, if you continue willfully uh, in that uh, line of the unrepentant state, then the church discipline comes. And if you still don't, then the divine discipline also can come in at any time because God can choose when he uses it. But remember, whatever form of discipline it is, it is not punitive, it is restorative. Uh, we pray that you will do no wrong. We pray you will do what is right. We pray that you'll be restored to God and his uh, family. And uh, so in closing, I want to say, let us rejoice. Let's aim for restoration. Let's strengthen one another. Let's be of one mind. Let's live in peace. And may the shalom, the God of love and peace be with you in a rich, tangible way. May his presence be with you. And finally, I want to say, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you for this amazing privilege of working our way through Scripture, slowly and steadily, uh, taking time to stop and to examine each passage. Lord, we are not trying to just increase knowledge, but we want to change lives. So we come and say, change our heart, O God. May it be like yours, as we examine ourselves in your sight, in, in front of your word. Uh, if there's things that are displeasing in our lives, in your sight, Lord, uh, point it out. Maybe we already know. Give us the courage, the ability to turn from it, turn towards you and get all the help we can from you to walk righteously. Lord, we don't want to do wrong. We want to do what is right. We want to be restored to you and to the fellowship. This is our prayer. And uh, Lord, we want to be of one mind. We want to be pursuing peace. We want to strengthen one another. We want to rejoice. We want to aim for uh, restoration. We ask, Lord, may uh, your love and peace abide with us. And lastly, we use those words, Apostle Paul, as he put the blessing, uh, may uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us, Lord now and forever. Uh, we ask this 
all for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, God bless you uh, uh, and whatever you're doing this week, uh, remember uh, to walk uh, closely with him and have a wonderful week. God bless you.